Hello, just to uh, introduce myself, my name's Stephen Smith from Australia, and I'm here with my wife from the downland, the land, land down under. We've been collecting pinballs. I thought I'd just start with a bit of a history from myself, so you kind of know where the information is coming from. We've been collectors for about 40, ye uh, 40, 40 years as a collector. We have about 40 machines downstairs. The whole Hankin experience for me started when with my Star Wars Empire Strikes Back, which is one of the pinballs that we've got on show. I bought that because I collected the rest of the Star Wars collection, so I've got all the different Star Wars machines over the time. I read an article, and the first of those was The Empire Strikes Back. I then read an article in Kinnekest that was talking about the Star Wars collection, but they didn't mention The Empire Strikes Back. So I wrote to Colin, and I said, Colin, you talk about the, Emp the Star Wars collection, but you didn't talk about The Empire Strikes Back. And he said, well, I've never heard of it before. So I thought, okay, well, that's something new. So I wrote an article for Colin and Kinnekest, and that's how it started. But while I was doing that, I started researching Hankin machines, and I found that some of the material that was online was actually not particularly accurate. So we decided to do our own research. So what we did is we went basically all around Australia, collecting pinball machines, collecting Hankin pinball machines, and meeting other Hankin uh, machine owners. Over the time, I've got a map there of Australia. How many, how many people have been to Australia? Some, most, yep. So that's just a, an example of how big Australia is. So that's overlaid the US. So for those that have never been to Australia, it is a very, very big country. The land size of the USA is only one point, what have I got there, 1.2 larger. So it's actually not that much lar larger than Australia. When we collected the, pin the Hankin machines, We've got, we've got the five, and it literally we, we drove from Brisbane, uh, where, where we got the FJ, we got uh, the next one from Sydney, one from Melbourne, one from Adelaide, and one from Perth. The total distance between the Adelaide and that round trip was about 3,500 miles. So it was a fair distance to collect the machines and meet a lot of people while we were there. We also met David Hankin, because I figured, well, if we're going to collect his machines, we might as well get to know the guy himself. So uh, we've had a, quite a few meetings with David. He was going to be here today, but unfortunately he was ill, so he couldn't make it, which is unfortunate. Through the Kinnekest Kinnest, Kinnest article, Rob Burke rang me and said, hey, I'd love to have one of those in my show. So he said, okay. And I said to Rob, well, why don't we have all five? So that's what we did. We brought all five to here, and they're on show on free play if you want to play them. We put out the word across Australia, out of all the people we met having Hankin machines, we haven't found anybody else that's got the full set. So we've got our own set in our games room, and then we bought a set here. It's the first time the whole five has ever been on exhibition, both here and in the world. So they've never actually been on exhibition, even in Australia, as a full set. And then USA gets the first time that they've ever been on show, which is pretty impressive. Uh, just a couple of things. That's my wife. That's when we met David. Uh, David Hankin comes to a lot of our expos, our shows in Australia. So he's quite a, uh, an active member of the pinball community still after 50 odd years. Where it all started was his dad. So Alec Hankin started Hankin & Co in 1955. He started uh, operating amusement machines. Peter and, Peter and uh, David, the two brothers, they joined the company. And in 1965, they opened up their first amusement centre called Orbit, which was close, to, which was in near Sydney, so over on this side. And the last one still survived in Perth until November 2016. So Peter and David were running amusement centres for 50 years, and over time they just kept on opening up amusement centres across Australia. In 1974, Alec passed away, and then. Uh, Peter and David continue the business, which then turned into Hankin Pinball. Just a bit of history on the history of uh, the Hankin Pinballs. In 1978, pre-78, David and Peter had pool tables, jukeboxes, and pinballs in different pubs and clubs. As you all know, the pinball industry was absolutely booming at that time. In Australia, Leisure and Allied, which was a company, had the monopoly. And because there was no Australian distributor, there was no Australian manufacturer of pinballs, uh, they got the pinballs into Australia tax-free and quite cheap. David, who ran amusement centres 
and had their pinballs in his amusement centre. So he wanted to buy the pinballs. So rather than giving all the profits back to um, Ledger and Allied, he wanted to have them themselves. They wouldn't sell him pinballs because they had the monopoly and they had all the contracts. They just said, no, we're not going to sell you any of our pinballs. So David, in 1978, decided, well, if, if I can't buy them, I'll make them. So he's the, he was the first producer or manufacturer of pinballs in Australia. He used his own uh, talent, he made his own boards, got his own boards made, his coils, his electrics, etc. So they were very unique. There was, obviously, there's, there was looking at other pinball machines, so th there is some similarities. In 19, between 1978 and 80, he made five titles with a, with a production run of approximately 1,300, which I'll talk about the different machines shortly. But he made five, Orbit One, FJ Holden, Dennis Lilly, Shark and Empire Strikes Back. In, as you all know, 90, about 1980, 81, 82, Space Invaders and the other video games were introduced on the market, which absolutely wiped out the pinball market in Australia. So David stopped producing pinball machines. He's still in business today, he, so he, we, we went to his factory in Newcastle, where he still produces pool tables and jukeboxes, and he's still got operating in clubs and pubs. So he's still very active. The pinball Hankin side eventually went through a few iterations and event was eventually sold to A&D, which is Amusement Machine Distributors, which is probably our largest distributor of pinball machines in Australia. They've got the main contract for Stern and very big in Australia. Okay, so the five machines. The first one was made in 1978 with a production run of about 200. It was called Orbit and Orbit One and it was named after the amusement centres uh, that David and Peter had, and a legacy from, from their father. So it's a space theme, it is, it is down there to play. Um, yeah, that's about it. The next one that was released was FJ Holden. FJ Holden, most, if, you, if you haven't been to Australia or don't know much about Australia, FJ Holden was our, is or was our national car. It was our first ever Australian made manufactured car and it was the most populous car ever made in Australia. The FJ Holden is extremely collectible. A, there was only 200 made, but also because FJ Holden, Holden then survived until 2017 because I've actually got the last Holden made. So Holden itself is, is quite, the Holden car is very, was our most popular car, or it still is and it was also extremely collectible. The FJ Holden is an extremely, extremely collectible car. People that have got an FJ Holden car typically also want an FJ pinball. So the, the demand or the want for the pinball is double-folded. Either you're a pinball collector that wants the Hankin collection or you're a Holden collector that wants the pinball machine. So extremely difficult to get. A lot of fun to play. The next one came up that was called How's That? And that was named after Dennis Lilly. And for those, anybody into cricket? A yeah, couple of people in cricket. Dennis Lilly, uh, in Australia, uh, cricket is, is, one of our, is our national game. So we're not big in baseball. We're not overly big in basketball. But cricket is our, our game. Dennis Lilly was probably our most famous bowler of all times. Um, and... The, it was called How's That? Because when he used to get somebody out, he goes, How's that? And then the ref would go, Yes, he's out, or No, he's not. So that's how the word How's That came from. The way David uh, made the pinball, he was actually at his, account at his accountant, and Dennis Lilly walked out of the accountant's office because the, the accountant was, was both uh, David's client as well as Dennis Lilly's. And he said to Dennis, Dennis as he walked past, He said, Hey, Dennis, I'm David Hankin, I make pinball machines. Geez, I'd love to make a pinball called How's That? What do you feel about it, Dennis? And then said, no, fantastic. Yeah, make one. So Dennis Lilly helped with the design of his own pinball machine. And the cost of that for David was a How's That pinball for, for Dennis. A really good game to play. It was the first, his first uh, wide-bodied pinball. A pinball release of about 350. So so far we've only got 200, 203 and 350. The next one was Shark, 
Shark was also a wide body machine. Really, really inter interesting and intricate artwork. So if you do see the machine in the pinball hall, have a, have a close look at the artwork, both on the play field and the back glass. Absolutely amazing. It was actually designed by a 19 year old, uh, the son of the bank manager. So the bank manager not only introduced him to Dennis Lilly, but then the bank manager said to David, hey, my son who, who loves doing art, would love to do the artwork on a pinball machine. So, so David said, yeah, come along. So the artwork was completely designed by a 19 year old who, not much experience, well no experience with pinballs, but a great artist. The shark, the reason why he did shark was if you looked at the original map of Australia that I showed, all of the capital cities are completely surrounded by water. So the whole of Australia, basically everybody in Australia lives somewhere on the water or not too far from the water and thus the sharks, because sharks are quite prevalent in Australia. We only get a couple of thousand deaths a year or something else. I'm not, not, not exactly sure how many, but it's quite a few. But a really intricate uh, pinball machine shark and great uh, sound too. The last one that he made was obviously the most interesting and, the, my, and my favourite. It was Empire Strikes Back. Empire Strikes Back Strikes Back was released in 1980 with a production run of 350. It was the first ever licensed Star Wars pinball machine, which is, uh, was not a well-known fact until recently when I started writing articles and telling everybody that it was. When I first t uh, wrote my article for Kinekest, um, we got feedback from uh, particularly people from, from US saying, well, we don't believe that it was ever licensed and we think it was a bootleg machine. Well, no, it was licensed by Lucasfilms, who owned Star Wars. And the way David got the license, he was very good friends with the, with the Gottlieb people and the Williams people and the Stern. He was, he's, he's a great mate with Gary Stern. And they, they were all talking about, geez, wouldn't it be great to get a pinball, Star Wars, make a Star Wars pinball? But they all thought that it would be too expensive to get the license. So they kind of never went down that path. Well, what David did, he just wrote to George Lucas personally and said, hey, George, my name's David Hankin and I'd love to make a Star Wars pinball. And George Lucas wrote back and said, yeah, good idea. And then when David inquired about the licensing fee, um, George Lucas said, oh no, we won't have a license. You can just have it, uh, have it, as long as I get one of the pinballs. So the license for the, the Star Wars pinball was just a pinball machine. George, uh, there is on the back glass, which you actually can't see, because it's actually down the bottom, on the back it, it's actually got, um, a license uh, copyrighted to jo Lucas Films with permission to use with David Hankin. So it's actually written on the glass, which is fantastic. The good thing about glass is very bit, bit like the, the space, invade, uh, space Invaders, where they get the circular effect of the light going around, the infinity effect, the, the great, and it makes Darth's head really glow red. It looks absolutely, absolutely fantastic. The artwork's great, the machine's great, it's great, great fun to play. Um, in the, on the brochure, there's also a picture of Mark Hamill. So Mark Hamill came over to Australia and actually helped with the, d the final design, uh, approve the final design. So it was a very, very Star Wars orientated machine. Absolutely fantastic. And there's, there's one up for auction. So there's one for auction at, on for Saturday night. So if any of you are interested in having your own Star Wars machine, it is, it is up for auction. So it's in the auction in the main um, room at the moment, getting put back together. The just talking about the auction. So on the on the auction, oh, each of those pinball machines. Actually, on each of those the original the five pinball machines which we see downstairs. When I talked to David about kept bringing the machines over to the US and he was going to come, he really wanted to be involved with the whole thing. So what he did is he, on all of the machines he's got a plaque. We put on plaques where he personally signed each machine with the limited edition number on the machines, which are great. The Star Wars that's up for auction, it comes with the limited signed plaque, comes with the, the, the full manual with all the schematics, a p the pin cup, the pin, the the pin mat, shooter rod, a topper, signed copy of the brochure framed as Hankin, a Hankin shirt, if you like the shirt with Emperor on the back. The machine's got new glass pattern coated eggs. When people think about Hankin, they think, oh, it's just an Australian machine. It's very, probably very hard to keep going. It's not. Um, Mike from Homepin were good, was good friends with David, so he, he actually now reproduces the boards and the coils and everything else. 
the plastics are, are all redone. Uh, we've got technicians in Australia that if you ever want them fixed, uh, we've got people that can help. And there's heaps of mods for them. So what's come from a very simple machine in 1980, we've now really made a bit more exciting. Are there any, uh, any questions? Yeah. Producing games that they were selling to other Australian operators as opposed to for their own use. No, uh, uh, what David did, did what David decided to take on the big, big, the big boys and take on Allied Leisure. So all the pinballs that he was making were directly sold to the public back, back in 1978 and, and 1980. So he, he only kept a few for himself in his own amusement centres. But other than that, they were completely open for sale. And like the... Um, possibly what happened in the rest of the world, when the pinball market crashed in the 80s and the 85s, they were, they were literally being thrown out. Um, orbit, the orbit was, it was trashed, even the Empire was trashed. There was a lot of, uh, for example, the Empire, I, I got a friend who's got an Empire, who then gave me 10 different boards, set of, sets of boards for the, for the Empire. That just shows how many have been destroyed over the years, so there's not many left. No, but David made them completely open to sale. And he would have loved to keep producing them, but it just uh, wasn't the right time. He, has he had a question? The, the question, I'll give you some context. What month was Empire Strikes Back released? And the reason I ask is because Space Invaders mm. was the spring of 1980. Uh, firepower, I believe, was uh, early summer. I might be wrong about the timing on that. Uh, and it's got the six targets yep. like firepower. Um, and then, of course, the movie, I think, was May of 1980. So yeah. w depending on when it was released, the time tell, – tell me about the timelines to get to, you know, to release date. Yeah, it was released in late 1980. And there, there is a lot of similarities between Firepower, Space Invaders, and – Empire. David was also great friends with the, with the people that made those as well. So when I asked David about about design, he said, "Well, we we, we just talked. We shared, you know, thoughts. We shared ideas. There was no animosity with a, with with David. Um, and, and yeah, they were all happy with the design and the similarities. There was no problem there. One thing was in, was was interesting though about all of the Hankin machines, in particular Empire, they weren't available for distributorship overseas." So to answer, the, to answer your question about, they were easily distributed across Australia. Anybody that wanted to buy one could buy one, but they were not for distribution overseas. So very, very few actually left Australia at the time. There's a few that have left since then, obviously, um, but very few at the time. And I think possibly the reason that was some of the similarities between um, Empire and Firepower and um, Space Invaders. I think they would, yeah, we'll, we'll have our, our Australian one and you have yours. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, so where did you come up with the idea of creating the shark machine? Because I think that's a, I think that's a very very cool machine in my opinion. The, the, the what? Sorry. The shark. Oh, the, the shark. Where he came up with the design was he wanted something to represent Australia, and shark is uh, renowned across Australia. He then talked to the 19 year old guy, the bank manager's son. And the bank manager's son came up with the concept and the design, and it was just out of his own head, and it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, that free thinking of a 19-year-old whiz kid. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. It looks great. So uh, probably a little different question, but um, can you just talk briefly about the logistics of shipping five machines here and <laughs> how much angst that causes you? Yeah. It, it was absolutely terrible. So nobody, so I couldn't, a lot of people were import machines to Australia. Not many export pinballs. Well, nobody really, actually. Everybody I rang said, well, we've never done one. We don't, we don't want to do it. No. So I finally found a a, one of our largest Australian removalist company called Grace Removals, who does a lot of home, they remove whole homes and they've got all, all the contract for all the embassies. So I thought, American Embassy, you do it all the time. Sure, you can do it. 
So they never moved one before. So so they so basically they said if they can be ready by I think it was back in May mid 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 May, we could get them there in about six to twelve weeks. Great. So we got got my on the day of packing there was me my wife my brother my sister their partners my mum and my dad all packing the machines to get them ready for Grace to pick them up. I said to them, do you want them on on uh, uh, pallets? No 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 no. So right, they turned up thinking they were just home stuff. And then they started picking up, they picked up the shark first and had to carry it 300, 350 yards to the truck. And I said, what are you doing? So I ended up putting them on my trolley to get them in the truck. Anyway, I got in the truck, they're gone. Six weeks later, I rang Grace and I said, how are the machines going? Oh, they're still in Canberra. What are they doing in Canberra? This, they, I thought they'd be halfway to the US by now. No, they, they got bumped because we had a, an American embassy to do. They finally got to Sydney, finally got out of Australia. Then I got a call, phone call from Grace saying, oh, by the way, we need to double the price. And I said, why? And they said, because we couldn't put, put the pinballs on top of each other, so we put them on their own, in their own container. So now you've got to pay double. So we pay double. Anyway, it took uh, nearly four, five, four months to get here. And it was so much stress because we knew there was timing to get them here. And every day I'd be on the phone. And then they get here. And, we, and, and all expenses were supposed to be paid. And then I get a phone call from the American company saying, oh, now we need to pay more money. Oh, why? And they said, well, you've got taxes. That's fine. I knew they were, they were coming. But because nobody knew they were coming, they sat on a dock in um, Cleveland for five days. So therefore, I'd pay five days docking fees to, to customs. Yeah. But it was an experience and a half, and we've loved every minute of it. And But never again. Never again. So I'll never bring another set to the US. <laughs> Just a quick question for you. Other than the Empire game, what's your current favorite game to play of uh, those five? Well, my, my, my favorite game is another uh, Australian-based game, obviously made in the US by Stern, is ACDC. Australian ACDC and Australian favorite band. Love it. But I've got heap, heaps of favorite machines, and it really depends on what mood I'm in. So if I'm in, in a 1980s mood, I, I go and play some of those. And then I mean, if I'm in a rock and roll mood, I'll play the ACDC or Kiss or Mandalorian as part of the Star Wars collection. Oh, of the five, out of the five by a long way, Empire, absolutely long, uh, followed by the Shark, followed by How's That, then followed by FJ, and then the Orbit. Probably in the same order that they'll produce, because if you, if you look at all five, as you go through the years, they just improve so dramatically. He learnt a lot in two years. He never made a pinball before, so he learnt a lot in the five years. Yeah, so definitely Empire. Yeah. One, one more, I think, have we got time? Um, it ended up costing, the, the, the original quote was 1,000 a, a, a Australian, 1,200 Australian, which is about 800 US per machine. By the time they got here, it was three times that. So, so, but I've learned since then, so if anybody does want a machine from Australia, we, we, we can now do it at a set price of about 1,500 Australian, which is about 1,400, probably about 1,400 US plus taxes. Yeah, because I've learned how to do it now. And that's not to accept crap from the removalists. Yeah. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, Cosmic Princess is another Australian game that was produced. Yeah, um, they're quite rare in Australia. They didn't make that many of them. And I know of two of it that are available for sale if anybody if wants one. Yeah. It does, and I've got a. Me I've, it does, yes, and I've got a blank spot. Now, I would love to see a complete reprint of that game. Yeah. <laughs> well, they've actually just brought out a, a Bathurst 1000 machine. Oh. Uh, there's a Ford one and a Holden one. Uh, it's uh, Peter Brock. Yeah. So, th so if you, if there's now a new a new Australian machine being made, uh, a King of the Mountain, and it's all based on the Bathurst 1000. No, he, 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 he's, he'd he probably be in there somewhere, but not, oh, uh, yeah, not specific. Yep, got to go. I what, sorry, one you, more? Oh. You had mentioned that, uh, you'd mentioned that uh, many of the Empire games were destroyed over, over time. How many, uh, do you estimate, are still uh, in Australia? Well, uh, my, my, my g well, I put out the feelers to try to find out how many were out there, and I actually know of, of, an, of 12, that, that people have contacted me saying they've got one. I, I personally would say there'd probably be no more than, uh, at the absolute most, 50. 
maybe 40. That'd be my guess. What would, what would you say from the... Australian Pinball Museum's got one. What would you say that'd be about right? About maybe 50 available? 50? Yeah, somewhere about 40, 50 left in the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's it? All good? Well, you, you get your... Oh, get me chockies? Get, <laughs> yeah.